to introduce Nelson Schumann of Restore to Freedom, and he made it through the storm. He left Wisconsin, <coughs> oh, yesterday. Yesterday right? morning. Yesterday yeah. morning, yeah. and he went as far as, he went down to Nebraska, and he didn't try to go through South Dakota where the roads were closed by 80. Mm -hmm. And so he made it through the storm to come to Gillette, Wyoming, and I just want to welcome you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I do not uh, tolerate storms stopping what the Lord wants to do. So, and I love adventure. So I love to. I get to see you know different parts of the United States and Canada, and uh, it's uh, been amazing watching this just explode around the world. Um, and um, it's a privilege to be here. So I'm thankful and grateful for you guys coming out tonight. Um, I know it's supposed to be, what, 16 degrees tonight? You know, I, I was in Texas for like three months, so it didn't get down to 16 very often there. So, And I, and I like seeing snow, because I'm from the Midwest, I'm from Indiana, and so uh, I got to see some snow, which is pretty, I think. I always loved it. Uh, I remember the blizzard of 78 that we got out of school for two weeks, so that's why I think I like, like snow, is because it uh, brings me fun memories. So anyway, um, so what the Lord's been having me do is share a little bit about myself, a little bit about my testimony um, over the enemy. Um, the enemy is, of course, in uh, his goal, of course, is to steal, kill, and destroy. And it's our job to recognize who the enemy is, what the enemy looks like. You know, because I know when I grew up, I thought the enemy, I thought demons were all in Africa. I didn't think America had any, you know, because I was told that, you know, well, we're, we're Christians, we're Christians, you know, you don't have any, that they can't affect you. And uh, I've learned otherwise, because I'm like, I've been in the church, I've, <laughs> I've seen it, I've seen people that have gone through divorces. I'm like, why is that? Why would they fight? Why would they strive? Why would anybody that are Christians argue, fight, and strive? That doesn't make sense. Why would they go through a divorce? Well, now I know why. <laughs> so I had to go through some things in order to do that. Um, but uh, I grew up on a farm, 160 acre farm in Indiana. I was in 4-H FFA, if you're familiar with FFA, Future Farmers of America. Although I did not want to be a future farmer. <laughs> I wanted to get off the farm because it was a lot of hard work. A lot of baling hay, we had pigs, we had cattle. Um, I showed pigs in FFA, or in 4-H. Um, and um, we had a pond, we had a wood. And my mom and my dad, uh, were nice to me, and I thought that that was the norm for everybody, but I've learned that that's a rarity to have both mom and dad love you unconditionally. And uh, I had a grandmother, though, that was kind of strange. She, uh, you know, my, my mother didn't quite like being around her often because she would, you'd have to do things her way because that's just the way grandma was. And I remember going to their house for the holidays occasionally, and we had to like walk on eggshells. We had to, grandma would say something to my mom, and then us kids would like, you know, I mean, it was, uh, it was interesting, you know, and my grandfather had to go along with whatever my mom or my grandmother said. My grandmother was like five foot tall. My grandfather was like six foot three. He was a World War II veteran, but he would call her mother, and we'd have to do whatever mother said. You know, if mother said this, we better do that. We gotta do what mother says. And I'm thinking, okay, this, something doesn't seem right here, you know, it seems like, why is mother like controlling everything in the family? And uh, that was just an observation that I made. And I'm thinking, okay, something's not right here. And my grandmother didn't have deliverance in her own life, which can sometimes happen, you know, in our in church. Um, I always, uh, I guess I've learned along the way is that if a person isn't at peace, if the person is prideful, then that's a sign that they are under the influence of the enemy. They're not the way that they should be, the way they could be. You know, we should be loving and joyful and getting along with people like Christ. And that's the fruit of the Spirit, you know, love and joy and peace and uh, long-suffering and patience and all that. But then there's people that aren't like that. And so um, what happened is that um, I went to Purdue University. Yes, they're a Big Ten school. They actually got to the Elite Eight in the NCAA basketball tournament. I love basketball, I love football, college football. And um, 
Anyway, I got married right out of college uh, to a girl who had a father that was pretty gruff and uh, rough, wasn't very loving. He would read the Bible, but he just um, wasn't, uh, he didn't feel loved around him. And my kids, when we had three kids, uh, didn't quite feel loved around. We just, you know, we visited them and we, we uh, tolerated and so forth. And so, um, and then I had a son that had something happen to him. We didn't know exactly what, but um, he changed when he was eight years of age. There was a boy in the neighborhood that uh, showed him some things he shouldn't have. And uh, that affected him. That affected my entire family. For the next 10 years, we put him in counseling and nothing worked. They put him on medication, nothing worked. I mean, I spent thousands of dollars on Christian counseling, the best money could buy, and it wasn't good enough. And so, um, went through and endured 10 years of a lot of uh, abuse from my son, and he abused really my wife as well, and his siblings, and couldn't stop it. And so I didn't have any peace. I mean, all he had was a lot of arguing going on, and he wouldn't listen. And I'm like, okay, if I would have behaved like the way he behaved to me with my father, I would have been spanked a whole bunch. <laughs> you know, and he got spanked, but you know, nothing horribly, but he was uh, very disrespectful. And it was a part of my training, essentially, is I needed to know exactly well, how people get affected and what happens when they do, and how real you know, the enemy is and how it, how it plays out. So that was part of my training. I didn't know it at the time. It was, it was not fun to go through it. And then ended up going through a divorce I didn't want to go through. You know, I, I couldn't stop it. You know, it was something that went through with it, and she did, and you couldn't stop it. So after 17 years, uh, I was pretty sad because I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't want this to happen. And But at that point in time, this is back in 2008, I started to hear a voice that was not mine, and it was not the enemy's. And so who's left? <laughs> the Lord. And the Lord was telling me, you know, what is it that you want out of life? He asked me, and I'm like, well, I thought it was money, because if I had enough money, I wouldn't have any problems. Like, isn't that right? <laughs> we think that, you know. But of course, we look at Hollywood, and there's a big mess out there. But I said, if I could have anything, I guess I'd rather have peace, because I didn't have any peace. You know, it was just a struggle every day trying to manage my children, and they were getting worse because of the divorce that happened, and I couldn't have my wife to be in support of me and making decisions and so forth, and she would oftentimes come against what I was trying to instill. So it was not fun. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of striving, a lot of arguing, and uh, then the Lord started to speak to me. And he said, now you're ready for your next wife. And I'm like, okay, what is, how do you find another wife? You know, How do you start over again after all this time? I didn't want another wife, I wanted my first wife, but I couldn't make, because she's got free will, to choose to do what I was hoping would happen. And so ultimately, the Lord brought me a second wife. And the second wife was hurt very deeply by three uh, divorces that she had gone through before. And the Lord was very um, strong because we went to a conference of about 3,000 people, a guy by the name of Morris Cirillo. Who here has ever heard of Morris Cirillo? So I'd never heard of a guy. You know, it's very annoying to me. He's probably like 88 now or something. He lives in San Diego right now, but he travels all over the world, just amazing. But he does it outside of the United States. And I didn't know who he was. And, and this girl that the Lord brought to me invited me to go. And so I went, and it was in Nashville, Tennessee. And Benny Hinn was there, who I did know. And John Hagee was there. Um, Reinhard Bonnke I had not heard of yet. And Paula White I did not know of. BB and CC Winans I knew of. They were singers. And so we go to that conference. It's a week-long conference. And the second night I was there, um, they had us go up to the front after uh, Morris Rowe had spoken, and we were like really close to him. And the Lord spoke to me and said, you are going to love her, which is the girl I just met like, I don't know, 10 days before. You're going to love her like Christ loved the church, is what I heard. And I was thinking, what? Wow. Awesome. And I was thinking, wait a minute, who does that? Who can do that, you know? We're supposed to aspire to that, I think. You know, Paul suggested that we're supposed to love like Christ loved the church. But how do you do that, you know? So after I heard that, I just knew in my spirit that, okay, I'm going to marry her. And I'm gonna, we're going to have a great marriage. This is going to be awesome. And so then that week, we had probably three different people that prophesied over us. And I had never had a prophetic word before spoken over me. And the word was essentially that we were going to flow in the gifts of uh, healing and deliverance and um, prophecy. And all I did at that time was pray in tongues. So I didn't do any of that. So I'm thinking, the first time you get a prophecy, you're kind of like, yeah. And they were talking about a ministry, like a worldwide ministry thing, too. 
And of course, the first time you hear that, you're like, yeah, sure, right. Mm -hmm. You probably say that to everybody, you know. But then the second time you hear it from a different person that didn't know that, you start to think, hmm, well, that's interesting. And then the third time you get it, it's like, oh my gosh. And then the Lord kept kind of speaking that week and saying, yeah, I'm going to take, I work for a company, um, you're probably familiar with Intuit, the makers of TurboTax and Quicken. So I work for them. They acquired an internet banking software company out of Southern California called Digital Insight that many, um, many of you would use to pay bills with and transfer money. A lot of the community banks would use their software to do that. So what I, my job was, was to manage data for the banks in the United States. Um, I, would, I, would, I would put together contracts between the core processors that manage the data and our internet banking comp company, which was owned by Intuit. So that was my job, you know, and I, and I never had any aspirations to do ministry. That was not what I was wanting to do, even though my grandmother wanted somebody to do ministry in our family. So ultimately, at the end of the conference, I knew that we were supposed to get married. And I'm thinking, wow, that was fast. I, you know, I just met her a couple weeks ago, and uh, wow. And so we ultimately got married sooner than what I would have done, but because I knew I was really hearing from the Lord clearly, that that's what the Lord wanted to do, and uh, so we did. We got married three months after we met, and then on our wedding night, I saw a different side of her that was not at peace, that was very angry, and I was like, okay, Lord, what did you do? You know, this is not what I signed up for. I was supposed to look forward to having a great marriage. And the Lord's like, well, yeah, yeah, I did say you're going to love her like Christ at the church, but that means you're going to lay your life down for her, and that she's going to have got a lot of pain, and she's going to take the pain out on you, and you can't tell anybody about what you're going to go through until, you know, I release at the time. And, and I, again, I was thinking, well, you know, how bad can it be? She's a girl. I'm a guy, you know, and... Uh, I'm like, I knew all these prophetic words, so I agreed to stay married, and then he showed me from his perspective her and how she was hurt by father wounds. He lost her three divorces before that, and they were like five years and two years and 14-month marriages. They didn't last very long. She had two sons with her first um, husband, and so I had compassion on her. I could see her then through Christ's eyes instead of, you know, going to be upset if she did something mean to me, I was going to basically love her like Christ. It's just how I could see it in the spirit. And so immediately I, I was like, okay, I will do this. And uh, so then essentially after a couple of months of going through a little, mainly verbal control and, and, and yelling and being mentored from a guy from California that taught me about my authority in Jesus and, and Christ and how to pray differently with authority, which I didn't know how to do. Nobody ever taught me that in the churches. That I grew up. I grew up, I went going to Church of God, I went to a Presbyterian, I went to a Assembly of God, but I never had anyone impeach me about praying with authority in Jesus' name. And so this guy taught me in about 15 minutes, and he said, you need to pray for your son, because your son has been hurt by the enemy. He's hearing the enemy in his thoughts, and that's why he treats you badly, and why he can't be at peace. Because you need to simply take authority in Jesus' name and command those spirits to be gone, and you'll get your son back. It sounds logical to me, and it sounded logical to me. I will try it. So the next day I did. I asked him if I could pray for him, and he said yes. So I'm like, all right, here we go. So I put my hand on him. I just said, I command every spirit not of the Lord, go in Jesus' name, and I will de declare peace over your mind. And then I looked really intently at him to see if I could see the demons flying out. <laughs> and I couldn't see them. And I'm like, I looked really closely. I'm like, they've got to be leaving because I, I did what he told me to do. And so... All that happened was he thanked me for that, and then he walked out of the meeting. Time will tell, I guess. So the next day I go out to mow the grass, which is something he hadn't done for two years, never willingly did it. He comes walking out and says, hey, Dad, can I finish mowing the grass for you? And I about fainted. I'm like, oh, my gosh, who is this? Reminded me of, like, Eddie Haskell from Leave it to Beaver, you know, <laughs> Mr. Cleaver. And I'm like, well, who is this guy? And he said, also, I want to get a haircut and apply for a job at Burger King. I'm like, what? So I give him the mower, I go in the house, I fall on my knees, and the Lord speaks to me. I said, what happened? He said, you guys, like 10 years ago. I could have saved myself a lot of hell. He said, well, because it's part of your ministry. You had to go through this because there's a whole bunch of people out there in the world who have had their children go through the same thing that your child went through. And now you can speak to them and teach them that they can do the very same thing. He said, now it, it will work once until they get out of the house. Once they grow up and they get their own authority, then at that point, they have a free will. They can choose to keep if they want to or not. They don't have the authority to break it. So what I do is I'm going to show you. 
my son's picture before and after. Directed by the enemy, and you hear his voice. And you can see the eyes are very sad. Eyes are like the windows to a person's soul. So it's really hard to fake when you are tormented by the enemy. And then when he was set free, this is about, I mean, he was instantly delivered. Different person, personality was just, you know, I could talk to him. But this is about a year later. You can see the transformation. His dream is like, oh my gosh, I want to do that, you know, the rest of my life. I go, this is awesome. I go, because I wasted, I don't know how many thousands of dollars on counseling that didn't work because those people didn't know about, you know, deliverance. And I'm like, I thought deliverance isn't that scary. You know, my grandmother did it, but she needed to deliver herself. But I said, this is awesome. I said, I'm a business guy. And if I can get this in 15 minutes, then I can teach people about this as well. And so eventually what happened was, I mean, he kept getting better, but my wife kept getting worse. And, and it was uh, going from one year to two years to three years to four years. People wanted to get in change her. She wouldn't get better. And I was like, oh my gosh. And she kept trying to like stop my ministry and, and I was trying to get her to come into doing ministry. And I started praying for other people, seeing some miracles happen. And, and so finally, eventually, she tried to stop me from doing ministry. And the Lord, you know, I'm like, listen, what's wrong? I go, why isn't she cooperating? Why is she being mean? And she got you know, more physical and throwing knives and glasses and um, being not nice at all and uh, violent. And the Lord said, Here's the deal. He said, you need to separate from her because the spirits in her hate you. They want to stop to see that. I'm like, why don't you get her delivered from whatever she has? Because I was praying for her, trying to do the same thing that, with him, and it didn't work. Well, because she had a free will. She could choose to keep that if she wanted to. And she would tell me, though, that she could hear the enemy telling her bad things about me. Well, I couldn't hear what she was hearing. So I'm like, well, I'm not hearing what you're hearing. I go, I, you know, I, I'm seeing the behavior that you're having, and it's just very erratic, but... It, you know, and I go, I, I'm praying for her. And there's times she's nice and sweet. Not all the time is she, you know, when there's other people around, she's very nice and sweet. But when there's people not around, then she, in 2015, the Lord said, you need to separate from her. Because then what will, I will do is I will start to set the ministry up through you, and it will grow rapidly around the world. People will hear, and, and you'll see, you know, tremendous success with, uh, with older people, not just, you know, kids and so forth. And uh, he said that she's going to go through some resisting of this and uh, will say some things that aren't true about you and it's gonna be kind of hard for you to take it. And I'm like, what? I'm like, I want her set free. She needs to be doing this with me. And he's like, she's got a free will. You cannot override her free will. And I'm like, I did though. I really wanted to know what was wrong, what was affecting her. And finally, two weeks later, I finally found out. I've been waiting for six years. And um, it was actually through a mutual friend because um, I finally was able to cut, uh, describe the behavior. And when I did that, she knew exactly what it was because her sister behaved the same way. She goes, it's, it's the same spirit that's affecting my sister. And I'm like, well, what is it? I've been waiting for six years. She said, it's the spirit of Jezebel and the spirit of Leviathan. And I'm like, well, I've heard of Jezebel. That's not good. <laughs> I go, but Leviathan? What the heck's a Leviathan? I've never heard that before. She's like, well, read it. It's in Job 41, a couple of other uh, chapters in Psalms and Isaiah. So I was reading um, what it was about. And uh, essentially it was describing, you know, the characteristics of like a alligator, like the scales where it's pride, it's very hard to kill or defeat, and uh, a nasty, scary thingy. But the last two verses really stood out to me, verses 33, 34. It says, on earth there is nothing like him which is made without fear. He beholds every high thing, which is a prideful thing. He is king over all the children of pride. And I could see pride, you know, all over her, a lot. And I was like, huh. So I started doing research on both Leviathan on the internet, as well as books, and Jezebel. And everything that I was reading, all the characteristics described her to a T. And they're, they're, and they're saying that, well, you know, when people are under that influence of that spirit, they're all going to behave the same way. It doesn't matter if they're a guy or a girl. And so I'm like, okay. And all the books that I was reading didn't talk about how you get those spirits. It talked about how the behavior was and how bad that it was. And it also was, it was really challenging how people get set free from it. It talked about, well, if you get them into a room, they're going to try to lie their way out of things, and they may come to repentance and, and, and actually own up to the behavior. But then oftentimes they go back and get even worse and you know, get more controlling and stuff. And, uh, and so essentially, um, 
the Lord explained to me, and this is what was like the biggest thing that I needed to know to get people set free, was how you get the spirits and how to get set free. And so he explained to me, he said, how you get them is through father wounds, mother wounds, you know, traumas, pains in your life growing up, you know, sexual violations. And sometimes a boy or a girl gets, you know, touched inappropriately sexually, they won't tell anybody. They keep it a secret because they're told to do that by their perpetrator. Um, but if they get hurt by a father or a mother that treats them harshly or mean or critical or judgmental, um, or they don't feel loved, He's, the Lord told me what happens is as that little boy or girl is growing up, they have thoughts. And not all thoughts are our own because we know uh, Paul talks about that in 2 Corinthians 10, 3-6. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not a high thing, which is prideful thing, that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So, Paul's talking about we need to take all of our thoughts and put them through a filter and not listen to the ones coming from the enemy, you know, and listen to the ones coming from the Lord and our, our own thoughts. And the challenge that most people have is, of course, when you're growing up, you think all your thoughts are just your own. I thought that, you know, forever until I went through what I went through. And then I started paying attention to the thoughts. And then I started discerning and saying, wow, that's coming from the enemy. That's not. I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that. So I started to discern pretty closely at what thoughts were coming in from the enemy. But my wife, she knew that it was the enemy, but she couldn't stop the thoughts. And so essentially what happens is, let's say that you were a little girl, and you grew up with a father that didn't show you much love, and uh, maybe he was more critical than he should have been. Maybe he wasn't extremely abusive, but he was just not there much, and you didn't feel connected. So as you're growing up, you may hear a thought coming in from the enemy saying, your daddy doesn't love you. You can't trust your daddy. And then as you get married, the enemy will say, you know what, your husband's just like your daddy, and you can't trust your daddy, and he's a man, so therefore you can't trust your husband either. And that thought would make sense to you. You're like, yeah. So whenever the husband would suggest something, then the enemy's telling them, you can't trust that, can't trust that. You have to make your, all the decisions have to be your own. So it causes them to be more controlling. And the same thing happens to a guy. If a guy gets hurt, whether through a mother or a father, then the same thought will come into that person. And then as they start to think those thoughts, of course, what's gonna happen? And so as you grow up, then that's gonna cause havoc between you and your relationships, especially your husband or your wife and once you start hearing the thoughts of the enemy and you start thinking that those are yours and that it tells you you can't trust anybody so forth, you will start taking it oftentimes on your own children because it wants you to infect and hurt your own children. And then what will happen is your children will start to get hurt and then the enemy is going to tell you that it's all the children's fault, not yours, because the spirit of pride is strong. So therefore you blame the children, blame your own. His, uh, he's had to sleep over at the pastor's house um, with the pastor's son, and the pastor's son touched him sexually and affected him the rest of his life. And he didn't tell anybody. I have another story where a, a guy was um, touched inappropriately sexually by his sister when she was 15 and he was eight. He told nobody. And then as he grew up, he started hearing the voice telling him he can't trust women. So therefore, he would call home and check on his wife every day, like at noon or one, to make sure she was not doing, you know, having an affair with somebody. She was like, really? For 20 years, I've not been doing anything. And, and yet he kept hearing those voices, which were the enemy, which sounds like our own thoughts. But we have to discern and take the thoughts captive that are not ours. And so after the Lord explained all that, I'm like, well, this makes a lot of sense. I'm like, no, you know, because obviously Paul's talking about they were supposed to take every thought captive for a reason. You know, if we were, if, if, if all of our thoughts were from the Lord or from ourselves, we wouldn't have to take every thought captive, would we? We would be safe. We would be fine. But because the enemy is going to be speaking, and, and the voice of the enemy sounds just like us, it's just, hey, well, Lord, this explains a lot. And uh, I'm going to read the characteristics of the spirits here next. Um, but then I'm like, well, how do you get a person delivered from these? And he said, well, that's, that's the challenge that you're up against. He said, what you have to do to help people get delivered is that they have to forgive all those that hurt them. And the enemy's job in the life of us is to hurt us really deeply through pains from fathers, mothers, stepfathers, stepmothers, grandparents, pastors, and then that's why we don't have peace. We're always striving, fighting, arguing, we're miserable because that enemy's voice is so loud in our head, the chatter, call it the enemy chatter. So you have to choose to forgive. 
And it may be tough sometimes if somebody's really hurt you badly. You know, if you, if you uh, had a father and mother that were really harsh to you, or maybe your spouse that you married took advantage of you, hurt you deeply, well, then you're going to be thinking about that. And he's going to keep reminding you, they were horrible to you. You should, you know, they don't deserve any forgiveness, blah, 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 blah. And you may say, I choose to forgive, but if your heart still has got a lot of anger in it, then you've not forgiven yet. And so the end of this pride, the Lord said, we have to humble ourselves. We have to repent for any pride, any behavior that we do that's not good. If we don't repent for that, you know, the Lord, uh, several verses I'll read here about how the Lord really hates pride. You know, he kicked out Lucifer, of course, from heaven for pride. And uh, the Lord's going to humble those that are proud. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the characteristics. And then we're going to come to our own conclusion. Because what happens, what I've seen is across the world, essentially, is the majority of people have these spirits as torment prophets. There's some that do. You know, there's a lot of you know, different ministries talk about Jezebel and Leviathan and Ahab. But the mainstream churches don't. Because they don't understand it. And so I'm going to read the characteristics, and then you have to be honest and say, okay, I might have some of that. And if you do, then what we're going to do is take authority at the end of this session and then kick them out. And then what will happen, I've seen, I've seen miracles all over the world where people will get healed. Because you think about it, pride can keep you from being healed. So if you've got a pain in your body, if you have leprosy like Naaman had, Naaman had to humble himself. He went to Elisha to get healed. But Elisha said, you need to go wash off in the dirty, filthy Jordan River. <laughs> he didn't say dirty, for, filthy, but <laughs> he said Jordan River. And I've been in the Jordan River. I got baptized there. It's dirty, and they have rats there and so forth. And, and so he wanted him just to speak a word. Heal me. And Elisha's like, no, you need to go to the Jordan River first. And he's like, well, if I'm going to go to any river, I'm going to go to these other two rivers that are clean. He's like, no, you're not. You're not going to get healed if you do that. So he had to humble himself first. And so that's what I'm seeing is when people go through these, they finally look inside and admit, you know, maybe I do have some of this. Maybe I do have some pride. Because it's often pride what pride looks like. And then you come to the conclusion. I wouldn't have thought that I had pride. I had pride back in 2008. You know, and then what happens is when people go through this prayer, then we've seen a lot of healings that take place. You know, there's just, in fact, this one lady said that uh, I was just uh, two days ago, I was in Sheboygan, Sheboygan, <laughs> Sheboygan, Wisconsin. And this lady said that she could feel the enemy spirits in her getting angry and like shaking. She did not want, it did not want to have her go through the prayers. And then when she did, she said it was gone. And she felt amazing. She felt light. She felt peace that I came because she goes, the enemy did everything it could to try to stop me from coming tonight. So, so here's, here's what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read the characteristics and, uh, and then let the Holy Spirit flow. So, so here's the spirit of Jezebel. So it's, its main purpose of Jezebel was just like she was back in the Old Testament. Now, of course, there's also Jezebel in Revelations 2, 18 to 23. But Jezebel causes us to control people. You know, we feel like uh, we need to tell them what to do. And that's what ultimately it wants to do. It wants to control the Holy Spirit. It doesn't want the Holy Spirit to flow. It doesn't want people to follow the prophets. She married Ahab. You know, Ahab allowed everything. He, had the, he was the king, so she was able to usurp his authority and take over, basically, and kill the prophets and uh, Elijah, of course, had this showdown on Mount Carmel and called the fire down and was able to kill the, the Baal prophets. But then she threatened him and he went and run, ran because he was afraid because Jezebel just needs to make one threat and it causes people to get in fear. Like, oh my gosh, so if people tend to threaten a lot, that's a characteristic of Jezebel. Uh, Jezebel causes us to manipulate to get our way because we're parents. Um, so it says you need to get your way on everything because otherwise, it won't turn out well. And so um, control, manipulation, also causes a lot of anxiety and fear. So we get a lot of thoughts coming in up here saying, you know, if you don't make this decision, this is gonna go bad. Or if you don't do this, then that thing's gonna go bad. So you can't turn it off. You keep hearing that voice of enemy. So all those people that have you know, a lot of anxiety and fear, they're hearing the enemy speak to them pretty loudly. It causes a, a person to be jealous. So you don't trust someone like you're married to because you know if you elevate your voice or your tone and get angry, the persons dealing with you will normally give in and give you what you want. You've been conditioned that way, oftentimes because your father, your mother would have been the same way. Um, also causes us to do some things that are sexually not pure. Um, and I've seen a lot of people that uh, will just say, I'm not going to have intimacy with my spouse unless they do X, Y, Z for me. So they kind of manipulate sexually, and that's not obviously cool. 
Um, Jezebel will justify to a person to lie, and they'll lie, and that's what hurts a lot of families and lots of uh, people individually, hurts churches, it causes churches not to grow because there'll be little lies that are being spread. You see a lot of church splits because you have a person that operates in that spirit and they're trying to get people to believe a lie about maybe the pastor, the pastor's wife, you don't, you, know, you name it. Um, but they have no problem lying because it says it, it, the means justify uh, the, the lies. So it's very, very adept at that. Has a desire for power and leadership, wants to shut down the true Holy Spirit, angry, and then once that person gets angry, then they blame them. You know, they say, oh, look how bad that you are. You're like, well, I wouldn't have done what I did if you didn't get mean to me and go off on me for an hour, you know, verbally. So it tends to uh, like that, to provoke people. They enjoy starting arguments. Um, they have constant chatter in their mind. Um, and if uh, you are, say, working for someone that has the spirit, they'll tell you to do something, but you have to do it exactly as they would. Otherwise, they'll get mad at you. Um, the Jezebel spirit is very perfectionistic. And I've seen this on the women more than the men um, that have it, but they'll, the women will actually drive a wedge between their own children. They will lie about what Johnny did, said about Sally, and then Johnny never talks to Sally. Um, Sally never talks to Johnny because of that. So as they grow up, they hate each other, but it's based upon lies that their mom is speaking. And I've seen that in a lot. My, my best friend, a couple of my best friends, their moms did that. They're like, why would a mom lie about you know, the siblings? It's the spirit. It's the spirit. The spirit's the same, whoever has it, whether they're a man or a woman. So, <laughs> narcissists by the psychological community, which they say that there's no help, there's no medication, you can't counsel that out. Well, no, you can't, because it's a demonic spirit. It's got a, a stronghold up here in a person's mind. Um, and then there's overt and covert Jezebel spirits. The, the covert is going to be much harder to perceive. They'll be nicer more easily but they'll still control, manipulate subtly to get their ways. Um, whereas the overt will like throw knives and glasses and yell and scream and chase you. You know, I went through that. I know what it's like, so it's not fun. 41. Leviathan causes pride. And that's the number one thing that it does. Um, but the number two thing that it does is it twists communication in a person's mind. So when you're having a conversation with a person that's affected with Leviathan, is you'll say something to them and they hear something different. They're like, what? You know, you, you know, like you might have said, I'm going to go down to the grocery store. And they hear, I'm going to go down to the bar. I'm like, what? what are you going to the bar? Uh, huh? I didn't say that. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. And they swear what they heard. And, they, and, and, it, and it causes all this arguments going on. It's being warped and changed. Um, and uh, you see it a lot, you know, that uh, a person says something. Or they'll say that they said something the day before and they didn't say it. And they'll swear that they did. Yeah. Yeah, I said that yesterday. No, no, you didn't. Because why? That spirit wants to protect itself to make itself like look like it's perfect, like it doesn't make any mistakes, when oftentimes they're making a lot of mistakes, or it may make them look bad. So if they'll say that you said something yesterday that you didn't say, they're like, I didn't say that. Yeah, you did. And then they'll swear that you did. You're like almost, in fact, one guy was in Shibuya he would do that a lot. And then he could play it back and say, listen, right, there you go. This is exactly what you said. And they're like, oh. Uh, and they couldn't lie the way out of it at that point. So, And then um, I started a healing room in my church, and uh, we had people coming in from all over the United States. And so it was kind of my training grounds of how this all worked. And what I noticed is this Leviathan spirit, it kinda like, it's kind of like an alligator. And oftentimes if you're having dreams of alligators, um, crocodiles, whatever, visions, that means that's the Leviathan spirit the Lord's trying to show you, which, again, causes pride and so forth. What we see a lot of times when you're having dreams about snakes is that represents the Jezebel spirit. But uh, what I noticed is the people that came into the healing rooms to get healed is that Leviathan would wrap around a person's spine and it twists. So it caused them a lot of back pain that they couldn't get healed from. They go to the chiropractor a lot, you know, and I used to have this. I used to have that spirit and I had scoliosis. I had headaches a lot and I couldn't play basketball in my seventh grade basketball year uh, because of that. But um, it causes back pain, neck pain, headaches, causes insomnia, so you can't sleep well at night, so you try everything to try and fall asleep, and it tries to keep waking you up, pinching your nerves and stuff in the, in the back. Um, fibromyalgia, I've seen like the number one reason for fibromyalgia is this Leviathan spirit. Um, and I've had chiro chiropractors refer their patients to our ministry, 
and, uh, and, and doctors as well, and psychologists. And because we're like, this is, a, this is an issue that's uh, spiritual. We can't touch this. We don't have the anointing for that. And, and you guys are doing it. We do it in a normal way, you know, because I'm like, I'm a former business guy. I'm like, I'm not going to do weird things, even though talking about demonic, some people think it's weird. But I'm like, I do it as normal as possible. The common thing that people do is yawn. You know, we can take yawning. You know, I'm like, that's fine, God. But I'm not doing anything, that, anything that's weird, you know, I'm going to. So that's what I do is I take authority in Jesus' name, like he taught, and then everybody's calm. You know, they can, you know, some people can hear the enemy speaking to them loudly or whatever, saying, don't do this, don't do this, you know, because it doesn't want to get kicked out of the person, so. Um, and there's uh, other access points that can come in if we're ever involved in some type of a secret society that are out there in the United States. Because um, my grandfather, he was involved in Freemasons. And I had another friend that was involved in that. He actually became a, a Shriner, and he admitted that there were some oaths that they take them through that are not godly. And he said that it's all about money, and, but yet what happened was this guy, he had a lot of physical pain in his body, a lot of things that went bad, and then it came down the bloodline. So like in me, in my case, I ended up getting this spirit, I believe, because of my grandfather being involved. He was involved in Freemasons, and I had headaches all the time. I go to the chiropractor all the time. Once I got delivered, which would have been in 2008, I haven't had a head. Separate the spirit from the person. The spirits are the bad people, the, the demonic spirits. But the Jezebel spirit was going to look for an Ahab to marry. So what that means, what's an Ahab? You know, I'll describe this as kind of what King Ahab was. King Ahab was not a strong spiritual leader. You know, it was very challenging. He shouldn't have married Jezebel. He should have said, no, I'm going to marry a godly woman, but he chose not to. Again, this is in 1 Kings and 2 Kings. And in fact, it says in the Bible that he did more evil in the sight of the Lord than all the other kings prior to him. What did he do that was so evil? Well, he tolerated this behavior from Jezebel. He shouldn't have done that. He should have said, no, put enough to come from a godly background. But he let it happen. You know, worshiping Baal. A lot of Baal worship was sacrificing babies. You know, that's what we're doing with abortion really today in large part. So that's why it's important that my, my friend Robia Scott's in the movie Unplanned. I don't know if you've heard of Unplanned movie. It's been out for now. I think this is the third weekend now, and uh, she plays uh, the bad girl, the Planned Parenthood. Uh, Cheryl is her name, and uh, she's really nice though in real life. She actually has a ministry. She's very prophetic, and uh, I've done some ministry with her. And so, and uh, anyways, um, but that's a part of that spirit. Why the Jezebels want to marry the Ahabs because they can get away with a lot of things. So, unbeknownst to a lot of people, when you get married, oftentimes you'll see Jezebel marry an Ahab. You'll see a person's got a stronger demand on their life marrying someone that's easier to get along with. You see that in probably 85% of marriages. You know? And so Ahabs also are afraid of being rejected. So they feel comfortable marrying someone that's stronger and more decisive because they're also afraid of making bad you know, decisions and having to take responsibility for that. And the Jezebel, so, so it's kind of like a, uh, a symbiotic uh, relationship that's not healthy. Um, codependent. Um, Ahabs oftentimes have challenges making you know, tough decisions. They can oftentimes be a, a very nice person, but they tolerate a lot of things they shouldn't be. They should stand up and say, no, this isn't right. We're not going to tolerate this. We're going to do this instead. Um, and, and then I'm going to read this. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. Most of us have read this before, but it says, these six things the Lord hates. So hate's a pretty strong word. <laughs> yes, seven are an abomination to him. First thing it says is a proud look. So pride, he hates pride in our lives, obviously. He does not like that. Kick Satan out. Kick Lucifer out. He came Satan. And the third of the angels went up. So a proud look. So that's the Leviathan spirit. So I'm like, okay, that's cool. And then you read on, it says a lying tongue. Well, that's what the Jezebel spirit does. It's okay with lying. Hands that shed innocent blood. Jezebel did that. Naboth, Naboth's vineyard. Remember Naboth? Um, Ahab wanted Naboth's vineyard. Nahab, and, and Naboth said, nope, not going to sell it to you. Think about that. He couldn't get Naboth's vineyard. So then Jezebel saw him pouting and whining and crying and not eating and said, hey, I'll take care of this for you. Um, just leave it to me. And so what she do, she ended up forging a letter, putting it in the name of Ahab, sending it to the leaders of where Naboth lived, and then they arranged a banquet for him. And then they had two scoundrels that lied about him, that framed him, said that he was coming against God and that he was uh, also coming against Ahab. And so they stoned him. They killed him. He was innocent. 
You know, and so then she came back to Jezebel and said, hey, guess what? You get your uh, David's vineyard now, so then Ahab's happy. So there's a lot of times Ahab's get things that are a benefit to them for being married to Jezebel, but it's not a good thing to do, you know? And so ultimately, Elijah found out about that, and he confronted um, Ahab, and Ahab repented. See, that's the, the difference oftentimes is the Jezebel spirit. It's very hard for them to repent, whereas Ahab's will be more repentive. And that's what's important. In order to get delivered from any of the things, we have to repent. We have to humble ourselves. And that can take some people, you know, the first time they hear the message, I mean, they may not be completely speaking to them saying, hello, hello, you have this. <laughs> hello, you need to get rid of this. Um, but I see a good percentage of people that instantly say, okay, well, I'm going to humble myself. I do see these in my life. I don't want them. And, and what, I, what you'll notice is, like, you could be an Ahab around your mom or dad, because if your mom or dad were really harsh, you have to be an Ahab around them. You can't tell them what to do or whatever. You can't stand up to them because they'll get mad at you. But then once you leave the presence of them, you turn back into the Jezebel that whoever it was in your family was. And you see that. You see it in holidays. <laughs> you get together for the holidays and what do you do? And then it's like you never have enjoyment around the holidays. Now, I've had families that have gone through and gotten delivered. There's one out in Washington that uh, they're on my team now. Um, we have 100 people now in nine countries that are doing deliverances just like I do them now. And uh, the sister got delivered first, then her husband got delivered, then their kids got delivered. They were like five, seven, and nine. And when the kids got delivered, they started doing better in school because they never, no longer heard the chatter up here in their own minds, which is amazing. And then they had the brother gets delivered. He didn't think he had anything. He said, there's no way. I know all these Bible verses. I don't have demons. And he's like, oh my gosh, I did. And then their sister got delivered. And then her husband got delivered, and then the aunt, and then the mom. And so the whole family now loves, and, and they're just hearing the Lord's voice clearly, and they're having fun, they're enjoying life, and they like to get together for the holidays now. So, um, let's see, oh, it goes on and says, A lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans. That's Jezebel. Feet that are swift and running to evil. Jezebel. A false witness who speaks lies is Jezebel. And one who sows discord among brethren. So all of that is Jezebel Leviathan, you know, because Jezebel is going to come into the church because it, because the spirit itself wants to get into leadership positions within the church so it can control and tell other people what to do. I'm not saying that every leader is like this, but you know, I've seen a good fair share of them. I've got a lot of calls from from uh, pastors and pastors' wives that are like, I need help. Um, so James four ten says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. And then Proverbs 29, 23 says, A man's pride will bring him low, but the humble in spirit will retain honor. James 4, 6, but he gives more, more grace. And so what does pride really look like? I'm going to read a couple things here. Number one, pride assumes you already know something when someone's teaching you. Number two, seeing yourself as too good to perform certain tasks. Number three, being too proud to ask for help. Number four, feeling the need to consistently teach people things. Because that spirit's going to tell you that you know everything. So therefore, I'm going to teach everybody everything on every topic in the world. <laughs> Number five, talking about yourself a lot. Accomplishments, your education, title, position, financial status. Number six, thinking you are better than others who are different or less fortunate. Number seven, when you disregard the advice of others. Number eight, when you are consistently critical. This is when we tend to put others down often because there's a deep-seated need for us to feel better about ourselves. People who are critical are that way because they secretly see themselves as exempt from the very same things they criticize others for. That's pride. Uh, number nine, consistent need for attention and affirmation. They like to have be the center of attention in public or secretly craving consistent serving intelligence or physique. Number 10, unable to receive constructive criticism. You believe you are never wrong, and everyone else is. Why? Because that spirit's telling you. You're always right. You know, I used to have this. I remember, I was pretty prideful. Uh, I wouldn't have ever thought I was, but I'm like, I thought I knew, knew a lot, you know? And so, uh, but now it's like, uh, if I don't know something, I don't know it, you know? I can't be an authority on everything, you know, so. Uh, number 11, overly obsessed with their physical appearance. Number 12, uh, they don't want to submit to. Number 13, ignoring people's attempts to communicate with you. So you may blow people off that don't have any value. 
you know, that they're, you're not going to get anything from them, so therefore you just, I don't want to talk to them. I only want to talk to people that can help me, that can provide me, that can give me more money, that can give me a better position in church or whatever, or, or in corporate America. I mean, there's people all throughout the course of the corporate world, you know, in uh, school systems, hospitals, you name it. Um, number 14, justifying our sin instead of admitting it. Oftentimes, and I'm like, I'm pretty sure that's not what that verse means. I'm like, if you're doing abusive things, it's like, you know, but that spirit's threatening, you know? And the Lord told me I couldn't tell anybody. So I had to go through it for, what, for six years. And then now I have an anointing over it. That's why oftentimes all of you have gone through things and the Lord wants to use that in ministry. Now, when you come out of all this, when you've been healed, if, you, if you've not gone through healing and inward deliverance with this, then what will happen is the enemy will keep reminding you of the past, all these bad things that happened to you. And then you get stuck in the past. It keeps reminding you and you get discouraged like things will never get better you never have hope you know and so you get stuck there you keep hearing the thoughts and that's what it really comes down to is we have to recognize the thoughts that we have and take the thoughts captive and if we don't you know i never thought anything i thought all my thoughts were my own i don't have any thoughts from demons you know because you don't see them but the, if you have thoughts from the enemy you're not going to be at peace you're not going to be humble you're going to be controlling, manipulative, angry, taking offense, all these things that are not the fruit of the Spirit. So that's why it's critical to start thinking before we speak. Well, have you gone into your mind lately? Because <laughs> I don't think it's very uh, peaceful and godly. Number 15, name dropping. So you like to name drop and say, oh, I know that person, that person, that person. Number 16, you're on a different timetable than others, so you can show up late for a call or dinner or meeting because your time is more valuable than anybody else. Number 17, pride will cause you to get angry more easily. You know, especially if somebody questions you, questions your intentions or your motives or statements, because you'll get angry quickly. Number 18, your inner circle of people think you say. And if they don't, they get kicked off your island. You know, I know one woman that um, she's in ministry, and if you don't agree with everything she says, then she tells people lies about you so that other people will block you and have nothing to do with you because that's how she does her controlling. And I'm like, Ugh. and then like she refers to enemies, like, you know, Lord's gonna kill your enemies, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, really? Her enemies are Christians who are godly people, but because she has the spirit, she doesn't trust anybody that's a godly Christian person because she's mad at them because once they are on to, to that person, they want nothing to do. Or there are a lot of cases as people that suffer more strongly with the Jezebel and Leviathan spirit is that they'll have a lot of other people that they'll become friends with that have that same spirit, especially in the church. And they'll kind of gang up on people and come against and spread lies and rumors about good people that are trying to do ministries the best they can. Um, number 19, you think of yourself as more spiritual than others in church. Number 20, you're going to be more touchy, more sensitive than your spirit, easily offended. Um, so you'll be basically taking an offense at the drop of a hat, but you'll offend people all day long and make not want to participate in certain events because if you're going to not win it you don't want to join or try and do it you'll look bad so you want to look good at all times number 22 do you avoid being around certain people because you feel inferior compared to them number 23 when's the last time you said this i am sorry for what i did to hurt you i was wrong it's really hard for people to have pride to say that you know remember fonzie so that was he couldn't say wrong you know <laughs> I remember that episode. He finally said, I think, at the end of the show. <laughs> uh, number 24, do you react to rules? Do you have a hard time being told what to do? And then number 25, do you worry about what others think of you? Too concerned about your reputation. So that's what pride looks like. You know, and if we're honest with ourselves, most of us have pride to some level. Some of us more than others. And if that spirit has uh, Leviathan caused you to continually, constantly live in that, state it's going to be hard for you to get along with people especially your spouse and or your children because I've, I've seen this there's a guy that uh um he was very prideful and um he was him and his son didn't have a good relationship well i knew it was because oh yeah my son's bad and this and bad and that and he's da -da 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 -da. and i know that he got hurt the son got hurt from his dad but it's like if the dad's not willing to admit and look in the mirror and receive it i'm like i can't get him delivered just like jesus couldn't get everybody delivered you know, I remember the Pharisees and you know, Sadducees, he knew their hearts because the Lord knows our hearts and our mind. We can't fool him. We can fool other people like at church if we see them once a week and act all sweet and nice and stuff, but we're fake. 
and the Lord knows the heart. He searches the hearts and the minds. So Matthew 7, 21 through 23 says, He who does the will of my Father in heaven, many will say to me in that day, so not just some, but to many, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, which is sin. So the Lord looks at the heart and the mind. He knows how we actually behave. So it doesn't matter. We could be in ministry, ministering to people. But I, and I know a lot that are like this um, because I get calls all over the world from people. And they're like, can you help me? My husband is a pastor at this church, and he treats me horribly. And I've been putting up with it, tolerating it for 20 years. And I'm getting sick in my body. I've seen a lot, of, a lot of the women that have dealing with men that have Jezebel, where they get the constant verbal paration all the time, and their bodies start to break down. And they go to the doctors, and they oftentimes don't even tell the doctors, well, my husband's being bad. You know, they just keep it a secret. And then slowly they're dying, like a slow death. And I've seen some that have died. There's one that went to Indianapolis, um, went to my church, and the wife ended up getting a tumor, and she just wanted to die because the husband was mean to her and mean to the kids. And it was turned out that the, the, the man was molested by his father. So he was hearing the voices of all these demons and taking it out on his wife and his kids. So his wife ended up dying. He got remarried. And then his second wife, who was healthy her whole life, within a year, she starts getting sick. Well, I knew exactly what was going on, is the demons that were tormenting him were now tormenting her. So again, it's important to separate the person from the demons and understand that they're just hearing the thoughts up here. They don't understand it. And that's why when I'm doing these, it's like no condemnation. Those that have been hurt more deeply will hear the voices more loudly normally, and then their behavior will be more harsh and critical. Those that have been hurt slightly may have a slight effect of this. And uh, again, I could say I had some Jezebel and Leviathan. My stronger default was to the Ahab spirit. So some of you may be stronger Ahabs or stronger Jezebels. That's your default. So, um, Galatians 5, 16 to 26. I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, which is witchcraft, which is Jezebel, which is controlling other people, hurting other people, hatred, contentions, which is striving and arguing, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So I had a lot of people around the world that told me after they got delivered, you know what, Nelson? Um, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have gone to heaven because I was really mean to my husband or to my wife or to my children. And now I'm a different person. I'm like a real Christian now. I feel it. I feel pure. I feel clean. It doesn't mean that you're, you know, not going to sin ever again. But when you do, you take ownership for it. You will be saying, please, you know, forgive me for what I did to you, honey, or to the children, or to whomever. You know, those that have a stronger Jezebel and prideful spirit with Leviathan, it's very hard for them to admit and say they were wrong. You know, and so that's why I've seen a lot of people come up to me afterwards saying, oh my gosh, now I feel like a real Christian. I feel joy, I feel love, I feel like the childlike innocence that was stolen from me by whomever, dad, mom, stepdad, stepmom, whomever, has been restored and I feel like okay I don't hear those voices up here anymore so when you go on it says but the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace long-suffering because there is no law and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires if we live in the spirit let us also walk in the spirit let us not become conceited which is prideful provoking one another envying one another so Jeremiah seventeen ten says I the Lord search the heart I test the mind even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. So then the Lord showed me that's what it really means to be a Christian, is for us to come out of agreement with hearing the voice of the enemy and be able to walk in the spirit, you know, medication, you name it. And what I've learned is this is the root of the issues. This is the spiritual root. When you get rid of that bad root, you get good fruit. 
that comes out of that. And then you're a happy person, you're a joyful person. Um, and then Revelations 2, 18 to 23 talks about Jezebel. It says, then to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman a prophetess. So she's not really a prophet or a prophetess, but she likes to call herself that. You know, I've seen that. People that are very prideful love the titles. Not saying that every woman has a prophet, it's a prophet or a, an apostle is not that. There are many that are. But there are some, you know, if they have Jezebel and Leviathan, they love the titles. Like, you will call me apostle, you will call me. That's why I always joke with people, they're like, what's your title? I'm like, uh, kid from a cornfield, <laughs> you know? I grew up on a cornfield, and then he asked, like, that's who I am, so. Anyways, um, so it says, nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet to sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality. She did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, which are symbolic, which are those that she teaches. And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. So essentially, what I've learned is that when we have been hurt by our father or mother or whomever, we start to hear the voice of the enemy, and we don't know that. And as we grow up, we then start to listen to the thoughts. We don't take all the thoughts captive. We think all these thoughts are our own. And then we end up having children. We end up hurting and inflicting the same pains on our children. And that enemy is one that's doing it. The enemy wants to turn our children into future Jezebel, Leviathan, and Ahab-spirited people. And so, if you remember the movie The uh, Shack, there was a scene in The Shack. You know, of course, the premise was that the man was beaten up by his father, so therefore he hated God. Hard for him to love God because of that. And so, they took him into a cave and they showed him and said, you're gonna be God because of people that were being awful and bad. And he's like, hell, 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 hell. And then they showed a little boy who was like seven, eight years old. He's like, well, that little boy is not gonna to go to hell. He's like, well, that little boy was your father. And then they showed and pan back him getting beaten up by his father, his grandfather. Well, at that point he knew. Ah, and that's how it works. And that's, you know, to get, to get freed from this tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to take the, basically take our authority and say, okay, I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to repent for my pride and things that I've done. That takes away part of the legal rights of the enemy to forgive everybody that ever hurt us and mean it. If you don't mean it, then you may have to do these again. But there's going to be a percentage of you that will get delivered right now. And a lot of you are yawning right now. As I'm explaining this, what happens is that the, the deliverance that the Lord's had me do, a lot of people do yawn. Not everybody. I had one guy who was from Iowa. He was an um, alcoholic and uh, was being mean to his wife. They were on the verge of divorce. And he came and said, this is the last shot. And he went through the deliverance. He didn't really feel anything until he left. After he walked away, he knew something to go to a gas station to get beer like he normally would. And when he did it, he wants to take a drink and he didn't like it anymore. And he's never drank any since. And he completely changed. And I interviewed them Monday on my Facebook Live. It's on YouTube. You can watch their testimony. And it's powerful. So we're seeing tremendous victories with people all over the world. I mean, uh, I did deliverance of people in Pakistan the other couple weeks ago. They did a translation for me. Um, I mean, they're just, we have a Jezebel Ahab Leviathan support group on Facebook. Um, people coming in there from all different parts of the world saying, help me, my spouse whom I love is being a chance like to repent, which is what he, he said here. And if they don't, then it's between them and God. If we've told them the truth, that's the thing is most people don't know what they're dealing with. And they're like, they're just being horrible. And they go to counseling and then the people know how to manipulate the counselor to try to say what they want to hear and they never change. <laughs> they come home and then eventually it becomes a divorce normally. And so what we're doing is we're seeing a lot of people save their marriages from divorce. Um, and then we're taking marriages that maybe were average marriages and making the marriages great because now they don't strive and fight and argue. They can have a disagreement, but it's not going to be healthy. You're not going to like raise your voice and have a tone because it really affects those intimacy wise. When you go to have intimacy, you don't have it. When you have a person that's struggling with Jezebel and Ahab, it's just S-E-X. But once they get delivered, then it's more pure. It's more the way God wanted it to be. It's just amazing. I mean, the results are just crazy. I just, I'm blown away at this because 
I don't know how many you've seen, you've probably seen 100,000 now that have been delivered around the world. The Lord told me eventually it's gonna be millions. Um, I mean, the people that have followed the ministry on Facebook has just blown my mind because I used to have like a couple hundred friends and now, between, is it 30, 40, it's over 40,000, like 43,000, something like that. And it's growing by 100 a day that are learning about this. Um, so anyways, um, so what we're gonna do is, for those that can stand, we'll have you stand, and just mean it with your heart, mean it with your whole heart, humble yourself and say, okay, I think I might have some of this. I don't want this. I wanna have a great marriage, I wanna have a great life, I wanna be healed, I'm tired of walking around with pain in my back or not sleeping well, whatever. You know, I've, I've, I mean, we've just seen tremendous amount of basically, <laughs> to cause them to drown themselves, but what Legion does is it takes you back to your past, the traumas of the past, the tombs of your past, and so you keep getting thoughts, you're reminding you about what bad things happened to you, and it, and it goes on, and oftentimes you may talk to people about it a lot, like, oh my gosh, my dad did this bad thing, and you do it all the time, when you talk about your ex-spouse or your current spouse, and say, oh my gosh, it was so horrible, you wouldn't believe it, and you keep talking about it, when you keep doing that, that's the spirit. When people are freed from that, then it's like you can acknowledge that, that stuff happened, but it no longer controls you anymore. Now you're free, now you're looking forward to the future, and now you can hear the Lord's voice clearly, and now you can pray and see a lot of miracles take place and so forth. We're also gonna break off witchcraft curses because the Lord showed me now that there are people that curse people and they do work um, the curses, and there are people in the church that do this. They would be considered white witches or Christian witches. First time I ever heard that term, I was in uh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and they're like, oh yeah, we've got a whole bunch of white witches or Christian witches, and I'm like, what? What's the difference between like uh, a black witch and I'm like, well, the, the Christian witches, are, they go to the church and they worship with people. And, and they want to control other people and pray for them and have them be dependent upon them. And then what they can do is they can curse them and cause them to have pains in their bodies and so forth if they don't do exactly what they want. And I'm like, you're kidding. And then I started doing research and there's 1.5 million of these witches that are going to church in, the, in America, which is more than the Presbyterians. There's like 1.4 million Presbyterians. So, and it's real. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take authority and break that stuff off. And so I try to basically go, what the Lord's been doing is having us deal with the strong men. You know, I don't know how many demons come with Jezebel. I don't care. You know, we know that, you know, and then Leviathan's pride and twisting of the truth in our minds. And then Ahab, you know, you're, you're like to give in to people and you don't, you're not a strong spiritual leader. So it doesn't really matter to know every single demon. I don't care about that. What I do care about is, we're seeing tremendous results with getting the big ones completely gone, and then the person's at peace, and they don't hear the voices up here, they don't have to chatter, they hear their own thoughts, and then when the enemy does try to say something to you, it's almost like it's at arm's length. You can tell it, you can you pick up, like, okay, if I let him keep speaking after three or four words, so I'm gonna shut down that voice of the enemy, and so I started learning that myself, and I now I rarely hear the enemy. I mean, if I do, why would I listen? Why would, why would you listen to somebody that's going to lie to you to try to get you to be angry or take an offense? When you pick up on this, you start shutting it down. And I've worked with people who are like half a billionaires and people that are Hollywood movie stars and uh, ESPN people and gold medal winners and Navy SEALs. I mean, it doesn't matter who you are. When you get tormented, you get tormented and, and everybody in between. So, so anyway, uh, I'm going to pray first uh, at peace and stuff. So. Here we go. So I thank you, Heavenly Father, right now. I just take authority over any and all um, demonic spirits, and I just shut you down. I declare right now I will not tolerate anything in Jesus' name. And I thank you, Father. We just charge the angels to come into position over all of us, and let's let the Holy Spirit flow and direct and give us all peace while we go through this. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so the first thing we're going to break off is the spirit of Jezebel. So just say, thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Heavenly Father. I want nothing to do with the spirit of Jezebel. And I choose to forgive my father for anything that he's done to hurt me. And I also choose to forgive my father for not protecting me. I choose to forgive my mother for anything that she's done to hurt me. And I choose to forgive 
And I'm going to pray and let the Holy Spirit show you anyone else in your life that's hurt you. You know, because there could be people that are way back that you don't even remember. Um, and uh, let me just let the Holy Spirit show you. And then we're going to allow the Holy Spirit to show you why they hurt you. So that way you can forgive them. Because obviously, if you were hurt by an uncle or an aunt or a teacher, a pastor, if you can see how they were hurt, just like that man in the movie, the shack, then you can forgive them. Because you can say, okay, they were just a little girl, little boy when they got hurt. And that's why they were so bad to me. Because that's how we—that's how the enemy can stay and legal right on you—is if you continue to have any type of bitterness and, and unforgiveness towards them. So right now, Holy Spirit, show everyone in their life right now, anyone else that's hurt them, and then allow them to see why that person did that to them, so they can forgive them. I'll give you a couple seconds. And I want you to do is just to say, I choose to forgive in the name of the first names of all those the Holy Spirit's shown you that have hurt you in your life. And I'll just pray in tongues while you do that. Say, I choose to forgive I in, the choose name of the in the name of the first names. Next, I want you to symbolically pull a knife out that represents all of those pains that you've gone through with all those people, and then throw the knife down to the cross to give to Jesus. And then I want you to raise your hand up to the Lord for a new heart that's never been hurt before, and then receive that and put that in its place into your heart. And then say, thank you, Heavenly Father, for my new and perfect heart. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for my new and perfect heart. That's never been hurt before. I ask you, Lord, to help me serve you with my new heart all of my days on earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I'm going to pray. I take authority right now. I command right now the spirit of Jezebel and any other demons report to you to be gone in Jesus' name. I send you to hell. I declare that you will never come back on them again in Jesus' name. And I just declare right now just a spirit of uh, purity, righteousness, holiness, Lord, let them feel cleansed right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Give them more peace in Jesus' name. Amen. Take about 10 seconds and just take some deep breaths. Relax. You may start feeling a little bit lighter. Sometimes it wraps around your spine so you may feel lighter you may feel it unwrap from your spine some people have felt that and um, a lot of healings take place with this so say so thank you heavenly father i want nothing to do with pride so i ask you lord for a humble and contrite spirit and i ask you lord to take the spirit of leviathan out of my life you right now and wrap your head, body, and tail from your spines. In Jesus' name, we send you to hell, along with any other demons that report to Leviathan in Jesus' name. Now I speak to your spines. I command the spines to be aligned perfectly in Jesus' name. Every disc from the top of the C curve to the lower lumbar, we command it to come into perfect position now. In Jesus' name, we command the tightness and tension from your shoulders to be gone in Jesus' name. Command the hips to shift into perfect position in Jesus' name. We also command any leg that is shorter than the other to grow out to be the same leg. I believe tonight and thereafter that you will have good dreams, that you will remember those dreams from the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will give you the interpretation of those dreams. I also declare that when you read a Christian book or um, the Bible, that you will not fall asleep, that you will be able to stay awake and retain everything that you read in Jesus' name. And we just speak 100% health and wholeness now through every cell in your body, we thank you, Father, and declare that they have a humble and contrite spirit that they walk out of here with. In Jesus' name, off the page, he could not focus. And I've had a lot of people try to read the prayers, and that spirit will like, call their vision to be blurry. And then they said after the deliverance, they could see things more clearly, like the colors looked more vibrant, and it felt like maybe a cloud had lifted from their head. They felt lighter. They felt just, it was amazing, a lot of dramatic stuff going on. Um, so next is the spirit of Ahab. 
A lot of people think, well, Ahab's not that bad. Like, yes, <laughs> Ahab did more evil on the side of the Lord than all the other kings prior. Ahab tolerates these spirits. And I know it's hard because that's what that spirit of Jezebel really causes is if you just, you just tolerate, let things go. And the Lord's like, no, we can't do that anymore. We want to be mighty men and mighty women of valor. And that's what he's calling us to do. So I know I have gotten delivered from this because I will stand up to people. You know, I feel a healthy conviction. In fact, I had to confront some pastors because they were doing things they shouldn't be doing in the church. And the Lord gave me a dream that the, the church was going to get shut down because they basically had Jezebel and wife, and they were taking advantage of people, doing things they shouldn't be doing, preaching things they shouldn't. And I didn't want to confront them. But the old Nelson would have said, no, I'm not doing that. You know, are you kidding me? They're pastors. They're well-respected. The Lord's like, I'm going to endure. Like you're going to. And so when I did, actually came in to meet with me and my other pastor, I, I had a boldness like I never could have explained before. And I was able to speak what needed to be spoken. And they mocked me and wouldn't listen. And I hugged them because I loved them. And they walked away. And within a year, the church was shut down. It had 200 people at the time. But they were hurting people in the church that were already hurt because they had these prideful spirits and they were saying things to people and hurting them. So the Lord shut it down. He sold it to the Humane Society. And then after that, the Lord told me, just like Jezebel was eaten by the dogs, I sold the church to the dogs. They're operating in those spirits because they're hurting my good people that have already been hurt. And so he's in the process of purifying, you know, the churches everywhere. Um, he's doing it in government. He's doing it all over the place. So anyways, um, here's Ahab. So say, thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Heavenly Father. I want nothing to do with the spirit of Ahab. So I command you, Ahab, to go to hell in Jesus' name. And I declare that I will not compromise anymore. I will not tolerate Jezebel or Leviathan anymore. And I ask you, Lord, to give me boldness and confidence. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I take authority, I command the spirit of Ahab to be gone, I command you to go to hell in Jesus' name, I declare that you will never come back on them again. And I just release right now just a spirit of boldness, spirit of confidence, spirit of Jehu in Jesus' name. Jehu stood up to Jezebel. So I thank you, Heavenly Father, right now. I declare that they are mighty men and women of valor, that they will not compromise, they will not tolerate anything less than what you would want us to uh, to uh, walk in, Lord, in your full authority, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. 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 Okay, take about 10 seconds, take some deep breaths, and relax. <coughs> and then next, we're going to break off the legion. So here we go, say, thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Heavenly Father. I want nothing to do with the spirit of legion. I want nothing to do with the spirit of legion. And I ask you, Lord, to take away all of my tombs of my past. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for giving me hope. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for giving me hope. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus name, amen. Okay, now I command the spirit of legion to be gone in Jesus' name. I send you to hell. I declare that you will never come back on them again. And I release right now just a spirit of hope and joy and laughter and fun in Jesus' name. I thank you, Father God, and declare to my Father that they will have an increased level of discernment, that they will understand when the enemy is trying to speak to them, and they will shut down that voice. They will not tolerate more than three words. They will pick up on it quickly, and they will shut it down. And they will only think the thoughts from themselves and from you. I thank you, Father, that you will increase their, their ability, Lord, to discern, but they're also their ability to speak words prophetically and with words of specificity, that they'll be able to be bold and confident, Lord, in all ways, that they are mighty men and women of God. And the last thing is to break off witchcraft curses. So say, thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Heavenly Father. I choose to forgive all those that have cursed me. I choose to forgive all those Take authority over all demons that were sent to hurt me. And I send them back to hell in Jesus' name. And I ask you, Lord, to protect me and give me a cover. 
And I ask, Lord, for protection for my children and family. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I take authority, I command right now, all witchcraft curses that were spoken and declared over you be broken off now in Jesus' name. I declare they have no more hold over you in Jesus' name. And we speak just protection now. We speak health and wholeness be restored in Jesus' name. I thank you, Father God. I declare, Heavenly Father, that their children, that they continue, Lord, to allow them to hear your voice clearly, Lord, and that they will not allow the enemy to speak to them anymore. I thank you, Father God, that you know their hearts, you know their minds, Lord, and that uh, you will continue, Lord, to pull them closer and closer to you to hear your voice, Lord, and to be obedient to you, and that they will respect you, Lord, that they will humble them and walk in humility, Lord, and if the enemy ever tries to get them to come back into pride, Lord, that they will repent from that, and they will move forward and continue to come up the mountaintop, Lord, and to draw closer to you, Lord. Bless them, Lord. Bless them financially. Bless them, Lord, to walk in uh, divine health, Lord. I thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And I declare that you've been restored to freedom in Christ. Amen. 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 Anyone feel different? Anyone feel lighter? Anyone feel some stuff come off? You know, that's what happens. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, you can be seated, and I'll finish up here. Um, this... Uh, the books that the Lord had me write, um, they're all $10 each. They're normally $13 on Amazon plus shipping. So Wisconsin, actually Canada before that, Texas before that. So, um, But Restored to Freedom is the number one bestseller by far because it has, it's basically written to give to people that have these spirits. You know, people that have Jezebel are hard to confront because they don't want to admit that they have it. That's why I don't put Jezebel in the front. The books that have Jezebel in the front, the Jezebels won't read because they're not gonna admit that they have it, they won't humble it. So, Restore to Freedom is a great book because it talks about father wounds, mother wounds, sexual violations, and then the characteristics. See, I used to be in sales and marketing. So, the Lord said, now you gotta help set strong. So I don't talk about Jezebel until you get to like the fifth chapter. And then I have the prayers to get delivered um, in the last, the latter chapters from Jezebel, Leviathan, Legion. I um, also have the Ahab prayer in here, but I have a book, book for the Ahabs, but, um, this is really good. It's, it's, if, you, if you know people that struggle from control, manipulation, pride, you know, it's a tough thing to, to talk to them about it. So if you can get this book in their hands somehow, or they won't take an offense that you're giving it to them. So sometimes people put it in people's mailboxes. Sometimes they put it inside their car. Sometimes they put it in their cubicle at work. Somehow someone will read it, the Holy Spirit's all over that, and then as they're reading it, they will like start to see themselves. And the Holy Spirit keeps telling you, hello, this is you, hello, this is you. But you can be this. And when people get delivered, it's such a beautiful thing. And then Waking the Lion Within deals with the Ahab spirit. So again, most people in relationships are Jezebels and Ahabs to some degree. And uh, so that's helping people become the mighty man or woman of valor that they should be. Um, and, and I'll say this. I've seen more women that struggle with Jezebel than men, but men clearly have Jezebel. Um, I asked Lord, like, percent. About 60% of women struggle more with Jezebel, and about 30% of men struggle with Jezebel, and about 60% of men struggle with Ahab, and 30% of men with Jezebel. So I'm like, why? Why is there more? He said, well, because girls, when they're growing up with a father that doesn't love them the way they should, they get hurt more easily. Guys are supposed to be like the fighters and the protectors and so forth, so they can kind of take a little more of the rejection than what a girl can. And then also he told me that the girls will get sexually touched inappropriately more than guys do. And whenever that happens, that gives a legal right of the enemy to start to come in. You know, you see a lot more girls and women, and it's hard to be not sexually, you know, touched inappropriately anymore. I mean, it's so out there, especially on the internet. I mean, guys get drawn into pornography and so forth, and, and those that are Christians, like, don't want to do that. You know, they're struggling because if they have a spouse that has Jezebel, you know, I, I've talked to, there's a woman, she was an actress and beautiful woman, and her first husband wouldn't have intimacy with her. And she's like, what's wrong with me? And there's nothing wrong with her. She's extremely attractive, beautiful. But he had the spirit of Jezebel. So he would restrict her from having SEX, rejected and feel really bad. So she had a, kind of a dramatic deliverance when uh, she got delivered from Jezebel and Leviathan and Ahab. Keep your peace on. We all want to walk in peace, you know, and that's, it doesn't matter how rich that you are. If you don't have peace, it's misery. 
And so the Lord had me write this. Actually, it was in four days that I was able to write this. And um, I talk about how to discern when you get out of peace. If you can discern it quickly, you can get back into peace quicker. But like you could have circumstances, like if you get something like in the mail, bill that you don't expect to pay, you don't have the money for it, all of a sudden the enemy starts to whisper to you, how are you gonna pay this? You're gonna go bankrupt, you're gonna lose everything you got. Da -da 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 -da. So you know, as soon as you start to hear the enemy's voice, you need to shut it down. Like I had in the, my back, I had a, a bulge the size of a golf ball. And I knew the enemy was trying to tell me that it was cancer or whatever. I wouldn't let him tell me that. Because I'm like, if I did, I'd get into worry and fear. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. <laughs> so what happened, it was like six weeks that I felt it. And I couldn't tell my spouse because she didn't have the same faith level as I did. But eventually I asked the Lord, I'm like, okay, what's going on here? And he said, well, I want your wife to pray for you with that because she was having some blurriness in her vision. Because he said that there's going to be something coming on her body that's going to be very similar to what you have there. And she needs to have the faith for that. So she prayed for me. I prayed for her. She got healed instantly of her vision problem. It took about three more days before my bulge went down to nothing. And then it came back like a year later. And again, at that point, I just took authority, commanded it to go, and it took about, I think, five days before it shrank back to nothing. But what I've learned is that if, when we get into fear, it's the enemy, false evidence appearing real. He wants us to have all these bad scenarios that could happen so that you get into fear. Then you're on his territory. Then he's got you. Because then he's, he can torment you. Then this bad thing is going to happen. So you don't know what to do. It's like torment, torment, torment. So this is a really good book to how to learn how to walk in peace and how to never lose your peace. I'm always in peace. And I don't care who might threaten and say this or whatever. I don't worry about it. The Lord's got my back and I'm trusting him. And, uh, and most of the time, we get into this fear and anxiety. Oftentimes it's because the spirits have a legal right. That's why we go through the deliverance. Then you kick it out and now it's like it's outside your house. So whenever the enemy's trying to say something to you, you can discern it. It's like, no, it's out there. I can pick up horribly, but he went through deliverance, and now he said, I can tell Nelson when the enemy's trying to say something. It's like right here, arm's distance, and I don't let him speak now to me like he was before, and I have so much peace, you know, and his family members are all in torment, you know, they're all, you know, billionaires, but uh, anyway, loving like Christ, how to love the heart and love people in your life. How many of us have that? <laughs> it's hard when you have somebody that, like, refuses to admit that they have anything wrong with them, so... This is a book, Lord, have you write as you're waiting for that person to get set free. I always say, get delivered, not divorced. If everybody got delivered, you wouldn't have divorce because they'd all be loving each other. You wouldn't have these thoughts up here tormenting people. Pure and spotless, are you ready for Christ's return? Lord, have you write that because this explains really what it truly means to be a real Christian, not a fake Christian because there's a lot of fakes out there that are awful behind closed doors. And when you, ex when you explain that, you know, deliverance, you get set free from that, then you have the good fruit that it talks about in Galatians instead of the bad fruit. Jesus loves to heal through you. I've now been healed from everything in 10 years straight now. I remember when I was being taught this by a guy that mentored me. Like, yeah, you can, because if you know your authority in Christ, you don't get into fear. Because you get into fear, then, you know, you, you, the, the Lord can't heal you when you're in fear. He said, Lord, I can only heal you when you, when you are standing in faith. You get into fear. He says that a lot of times people go to the doctors first, and then if they can't get healed of that, then they're like crying out to God, you know, please, please, please. He said that what I'd like them to do, the first thing, is to cry out to me and take authority in Jesus' name, that Jesus died on the cross for us to get the authority from him. And that's what I've learned, and I've been healed now of everything. I dropped my health insurance back in 2012, so I don't have any, and I don't worry about it. I've been healed from everything. I don't have any headaches anymore, which is a miracle, because I used to have always lots of headaches and stuff. And, I didn't like that. <laughs> Choosing a godly mate. How to find the real deal before saying, I do. Uh, wish I would have read this book <laughs> before my first and second marriage. <laughs> so, but I learned a lot. I mean, that's why I went through that. So, you know, everybody should, you know, go through being set free from the pains of their past before they get married because then they become a different person. And they can discern people better because what I've seen a lot of is people that have Jezebel will put their best foot forward oh my gosh, who did I marry? They're not the same person. They're mad, they're evil, they're angry. So this gives you a lot of help as to when you're getting ready to get married. You, know, and you, get, you need to get delivered because if you have Ahab, you're going to continue to draw into a relationship to be controlled because you'll feel safe with the person that's going to be all this making decisions and everything. But you don't really want that. You know? So when you get delivered, 
then you will draw to someone that's more healthy and you'll be able to see the signs quicker so that you don't say I do when you should have said I don't. <laughs> so anyways, losses and finances and uh, health, um, uh, but things that don't look good and how to change it by speaking words of faith. Like uh, I remember I wanted, uh, my daughter was being hurt, but uh, my first wife, she was being more controlling than what she should. And I, we had shared custody. And she wanted, and we, we had we put a thing in our closet that the kids could live with the other parent if they wanted to more often. Well, my daughter wanted to live with me uh, full time, but my wife wouldn't. And so I had to go thank the Lord basically for like, for, you know, there's so many times people go to court, go to court, go to court, go to court. And I, I give examples of here going to court where I don't, I didn't have an attorney. Like I went like, I don't know, seven times against two ex-wives and they had attorneys. And the Lord, the Lord blessed me. He protected me. In one case, he overturned a judge's decision. That was a bad decision. <laughs> and so, anyway, give a lot of good examples of what faith can do when we speak it out. You know, even though the circumstances look bad, they look really bad for me. You know, after I went through my, uh, with my wife, my second wife, and uh, like, there's no way that this is going to ever happen. Well, it's happened, and it keeps on growing. And so, and then the last thing, this is tomorrow. We're doing a class, a training. Um, again, we've had 100 people in nine countries now that have been certified under restorative freedom, and they're doing deliverances. A lot of people have never done ministries before in their lives. But what happens is the Lord's using a lot of people that have been hurt deeply by these spirits in people to then raise them up to help others get delivered from this. So tomorrow I'll be doing the class. It's one to, four, one to five. It's a four-hour class um, that you go through that. You can also go through online. I've got it on YouTube. Um, and then you need to get this. This is basically a guide that I used um, essentially when I delivered people um, individually. So you need to get this book and then these two, and then you can attend tomorrow's training from one to five, or you can go on YouTube and watch the videos, and then you can be certified as a restorative freedom deliverance person. And then you can pass it on and help other people get set free. Um, and then I, I encourage people to make a donation to you personally that I don't, I don't care, you know, I don't receive anything from that. So, so there are people that are now doing more deliverances. There's one lady, she does them with people all over the world. Um, you can get seven books for $60, so I'd give you a special break. Um, I could do credit cards, debit cards. Um, if you get all of these, then it's a total of 75. I also have these three in German, which are over there. I also have Restorative Freedom in Spanish. And uh, all of my books are available on Audible. They're also, so I'm, I'm one reading the book, and they're also available on Kindle, which you can order on Amazon. So, all right, I'll turn things over back to you now. The weekend after Easter, two weeks from tonight, Nelson will be in Billings, Montana at the Everlasting Covenant. Covenant Congregation, <coughs> I think. Yes, Covenant Congregation, Nelson has uh, restored to freedom.com that has his event calendar on it Facebook uh, channel uh, Nelson Schumann 67 and also on um, YouTube YouTube and and also I wanted to say that um, he has a lot of videos um, if you have a family member that maybe is in on his YouTube channel there are a lot of uh, deliverance videos uh, testimonies and um, uh, there's a lot of information out there and, um, and I just want to make sure I reminded you about the buildings and also tomorrow, um, one o'clock. And basically he's going to be doing the same thing, but it's in more detail, right. but he will go through this deliverance as well. So if yeah. someone can handle sitting here three hours or four hours tomorrow, it's definitely going to run through it again. And I'm going to just tell you quickly that I, it, for me myself, it was just that, um, I think that I had some issues and I had to, to go through a lot more and so I thank you Lord that I believe I've been completely delivered tonight um, and I thank God and I'm just going to speak life and say I don't have any more layers but um, Holy Spirit I ask you deals with me if I do so I can be set free because I don't want to walk around with no peace and um, I just thank Nelson for coming and and for um, being willing to be obedient to the Holy Spirit and and thank you so much thank you Nelson you're welcome.